Thank you so much, Emily. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, so um, I'm going to assume you can. If you can't, someone holler at me. Um, my name is Darla Helt, and I am the executive director at Peace. Um, Peace is a small nonprofit here in Washington State. We currently have programs in Clark, Skamania, Klickitat, and um, Spokane County. But what brought me to this pro to this work, and I've been doing this work for right at 30 years at this point in time, is my children. I am the mother of um, three grown men and um, two of my three adult men um, sons experienced developmental disabilities. So I remember when um, my first son was born with a disability, we um, found out really before they even cut the cord. And so he was maybe five or six weeks old when we started getting connected to services and getting the supports that he needed. Um, my youngest son was had a different path and he was almost two before we had him diagnosed um, as being on the spectrum. And at that point in time, with my, my first son with a disability, once we went to DDA, we got services right away. When my second, my youngest son um, was diagnosed and we went to the developmental disabilities, they, he went on a waiting list for four years. And I thought then, wow, I better get busy and get things fixed before they turn 18. <laughs> I think about that now and I just want to laugh because clearly I they're way older than 18 and nothing is fixed, but um, we've done a lot of work in the last 30 some years. So that's why I'm here. Um, this topic we're gonna talk about tonight, this really is a facilitated brainstorming. So what I want you to do before we get too far down the path is I want you to think of one individual that you really want to um, connect with on who you want to help build a whole life. If you are an educator, think of one student. If you are a parent or a self-advocate, obviously that makes it way easier to decide who you're thinking about. But this really is a process because nobody's life looks the same. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna get started. Okay, so building a whole life. It's a journey, not a destination and it changes throughout life. So one of the things I wanna hear from you guys, and I want you to put this in the chat, please, is um, what does it mean? What does a whole life mean to you? So please take a moment, put something in, in the chat. If you can identify what are the things that are important to you to have a whole life. And Darla, I'll help with the chat as it rolls in. Uh, friends, family, work, recreation, purpose. Yeah, those are some great, great ideas. Those are some of the things. Choice, contentment, absolutely. Absolutely. Potential for success in all aspects of life. Absolutely. Anyone else? Uh, Purpose, self-worth, motivation, independence. Yeah. I think as many people as we have, we really can be looking at what are those things that we need for a whole life. Oh, Emily, go for it. I dropped some. There we go. I know. Darling, you were on it, and, and now I was off. Okay. Uh, my teachers, friends, and family, dignity. Yeah, community, social family, life. yeah, social life, things to do that are fun, happiness and purpose. Sorry, Emily. <laughs> We're a great team. No comment will be left behind. <laughs> there you go. Okay, dignity and excitement for the future. Aren't those the things that we all want? I don't think it's any different for an individual who experiences a disability. Um, in my mind, that's kind of like saying, you know, a person with red hair wants something different than a person with blonde hair. We all want an individual life and the different things that that means to us. Tonight, we're going to be going over some of these things, but uh, clearly there's some of those things that we're going to have to continue to work on. 
So tonight we're going to talk about the people we connect with, who's important to us, our friends and family, our teachers, all of those kinds of things. A place to live. What does that look like and, and who do we want to live with, right? Something to do, purpose, belonging, dignity can go into that as well. Transportation, how do we get there? And um, how much freedom do we have to come and go and do the things that we want to do? Um, something to believe in, right? What is important to you? What is the thing that excites you for the future? What are those pieces that really kind of get you up and get you going in the day? And uh, making sure that everybody has the opportunity to find their own voice. I think one of the um, comments up here was about independence, purpose, self-worth, and motivation. When I think about finding your own voice, those are some of the things that I think about. Um, and a way to pay for things, right? That's a part we don't want to think about, but all of us kind of have to think about that because how we pay for things really um, impacts what it is we can do or what it is we can't do. So those are some of the things we're going to be going over this evening. But let's start with friends and family, right? So those of you who still have um, individuals in school, the individual that you're thinking about is still in the school setting, you know, they may connect with their friends at school, you know, but a lot of people don't connect with their friends outside of school. And what happens when that school bus no longer comes? As we found out last year, how many of us was able to stay connected to our friends and what did that look like? Um, Peace does a uh, training each week. It's called Building Independence. And it's led by individuals with disabilities for individuals with disabilities, and they get to choose their topics. And prior to COVID, we did that in person. Um, we were really nervous when COVID hit and we took everything online. We wasn't sure how the young adults were going to adapt to Zoom. And I'm here to tell you, they did much better than the parents did. Um, they just automatically switched over and they are doing excellent. They meet weekly with it on Zoom and um, I've it's just continued to grow and flourish. And I've just been astonished at the skills and the strengths that our young adults have um, around technology that someone like me, a grandma just really doesn't necessarily, it's not second nature to me. So friends and family, it's important that you start being intentional intentional about how you're going to connect with your friends and family, right? Um, because when the school bus doesn't come, right, then we need to um, really look at when are we going to connect with our friends and how are we going to connect with those friends. Carrie, the name of that program is Building Independence. And it's for individuals who are over the age of 18. Um, we will, I don't know if I'll have an opportunity to put a link in the chat, but I bet Tanya can do that while I'm talking. Um, and so anyway, how is it that we're going to intentionally connect? I will tell you the biggest disability, the hardest disability to overcome is loneliness. And that's why we always start with friends and family. I think that is the most important thing. And family doesn't always live as close as they used to. So while family um, might, you know, you, an individual might live with mom or dad, or they might live with a sibling, how is it they're going to get to see grandma? How do they see their aunts and their uncles? How do they connect with their cousins? Are they close to their cousins or do they have other relatives? Those are all those bits and pieces that we need to think about when we think about how are we going to set up a whole life, right? It takes a team of people. You think about any one of us and for us to be successful and for us to really feel balanced and whole, right? We have all of these people in our life, right? We have our family or our and our friends, right? We have our special person, whoever that special person is. It might be a husband or a wife, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or it, it might be your best friend, right? But most people need to have that other person, that person that's their person that they can really connect to. And then those paid support, right? So our sons and daughters are no different than that. 
They need to connect to their family, but we don't want family to be their only friends, their only people, and their paid support, right? We want them to have a variety of life so that um, they have as many people and as much interaction as possible. I often say people frequently will call me the green reaper because I'm always talking about when I die. But on the day I die, I want my children to grieve their mom. I don't want them to lose their care provider, their home, their best friend, their rock um, to help them stabilize. That being said, I don't know that I have all of that figured out yet. Um, I've got some of it figured out, but one of my young guys doesn't have a person yet. I'm his person. And while that's fine, it's not going to be fine when I'm not here. So how do I help him find a person? These are all different things that we're going to be thinking about. Um, when you're in school, it's an excellent time to start teaching, calling, texting, email. Even if it's FaceTime, if a person is nonverbal, can we find technology ways to help them connect with others? Can we get contact information of our friends? And can we start building some of those activities outside of school? What do those things look like, right? Do they have opportunities that they go spend time with a relative when you're not with them, right? So what does it look like to go hang with a cousin or go to grandma's house, right? And so, and then we'll go on and talk more about your person. And um, I really want to share with you about my son, Jesse. Um, well, you can kind of maybe see a picture of Jesse and his person up in the corner over there. And I just realized I forgot to give a visual description of myself. I'm so sorry. Um, my son, Jesse, kept talking to me about wanting to date. He wanted to date. He wanted to date. And, you know, you'd do anything for your kids, right? Um, but you can't, like, go to the store and buy a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever. That It doesn't work that way. So what do we do and how do we do it? Oh, and here he comes. Um, he's telling me his exact words were, Mom, I want a girlfriend. Mom, I want... Oh, mom, I need a girlfriend. Those were his exact words. I'm being corrected. Do you want to come around and tell him what your exact words were? Okay, mom, I need and want a girlfriend. Those were his exact words. So we got involved. <laughs> we got involved in several different things, Special Olympics, some classes through fame, different things, trying to be in places where we might meet somebody that might become his person, right? Um, and that really didn't work. And so um, then it's like, okay, what are we going to do? So we started a class called So You Want a Date. And um, actually, it was from that class that the building independence rolled out of. But the So You Want a Date class happens once a year. It's about six weeks. It's once a week for six weeks. And they talk about relationship skills. And this is a class, honestly, I think any of us should have had in middle school, high school. It is a phenomenal class. What's important to you? What's your line in the sand? How do you um, collaborate with others? What are you willing to do? to give on, who's a friend, who's not a friend. Um, there's just a ton of topics. And through that class, he was able to meet his current person, Jackie, um, who is the love of his life. And him and Jackie spend so much time together. And I'm telling you, it made a huge difference in his life. But it took us a while to find, for him to find his person. Jesse's 32 now. And he's here visiting me this evening. So you might hear him popping in and out or making comments and correcting me as the evening goes on. Um, my other son doesn't have his person yet. And I'm just here to tell you, finding your person, even if it's your best friend, is really important. 
So trying to figure out how do we make those connections. We don't want loneliness to be the thing that defines us. It defines our kids. Okay, let's move on to home, right? Home, where are they going to live? With whom are they going to live with? Um, the type of environment they want? Who can assist them in their type of decor? Home is um, another program, actually, that Peace runs. Um, it's called Housing Options Must Exist. Because any of you that have looked at the housing market lately know how absolutely expensive um, rentals are. And what does that look like? And that's just talking about the physical environment, not even speaking about how do we get the help that we need. Um, Peace is currently working on, we've hired a, a housing coordinator, um, Darcy, who's amazing. And we're working with the um, housing authority. We're working with um, partners for housing around roommate matching. We're setting up some different um, ideas and, and things. So pay attention because in January, we're going to be rolling out a whole lot of new ideas and programs around housing and home um, for our individuals who experience disabilities. Um, and that affordable unit to live in is just part of it, right? That's only one piece of the housing. But let's take that piece for a minute and go forward. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, my son or daughter's going to live with me. Well, that's great. Um, I'm here to tell you when they turn 18, 19, 20, 21, they may not want to live with you. Um, <laughs> and what I found is as a mom, most kids 17, 18 years old are, I'm an adult, I'm an adult, I'm going to move out on my own, you can't tell me what to do. And it really doesn't matter the level of disability, because they hear all of their peers saying that. Um, when my youngest turned 18, and he just kept going on about he was an adult, and I couldn't tell him what to do. And I said to him, I finally said, you're right, I can't let's go put your name on a waiting list for an apartment. And the waiting list was really long. He didn't have a chance of getting in. But just putting his name on that waiting list hushed him up. He uh, did not push back quite so hard. And he really uh, started being a little more respectful in that teenage communication with me. There's a place in town called Teammates. And um, they're eight little units. Um, they're about 560 square feet in each unit, a little individual condo. And they were built by some parents who have um, sons who experience developmental disabilities and um, one of the local nonprofits and some state funding all came together to build these units. And um, on occasion, these units come open. So, when my son was 19 years old, my youngest, um, one of these units came open and I was advertising it out to all the families like I always do, right? This is what we have open. This is what's going on. If you know one, someone who might be interested, um, please let me know. Um, and my friend, who was one of the moms who originally helped build it, called me and she said, you need to apply for that for Rory, my youngest. And I'm like, oh, no, he's nowhere near being ready to move out on his own. We're just we're not there yet. And she's like, it doesn't matter. They don't come open that often. You need to apply. She said, even if he just goes there on the weekends or has a place to hang out or story stuff, you need to start. And I thought, wow. OK, so I applied and lo and behold, he got the unit. <clears throat> so he was 19 at that point in time. It took us a year before he spent the first night there. Now we could do that because it was a subsidized unit. You know, when our kids turn 18, they will start paying you as the parent um, rent. If you don't charge them rent for their room in your home, then their social security is going to be deducted by the amount that social security deems appropriate for rent. Um, they're going to assume that you're gifting them that amount of money. 
Um, so I highly recommend to parents that you do charge your son or daughter rent once they turn 18 so that they can pull down the maximum amount of social security. Once they pay you that portion of rent or, or their, their contribution to um, the living situation, then that becomes your funds that you can save to put a down payment down on a house for them. You could put it in a special needs trust fund. You could put it in your bank account and use it to cover expenses that other programs are not going to cover. Um, so many of the adult service programs, there's things they'll cover and there's things they won't, but they're not going to cover everything our kids need. And so trying to find ways to get the strings off the dollars is one of the ways that you then can build up an excess pot of funds to help cover some of those expenses. So we got the house, this condo teammates unit. Um, we, he, he wouldn't even, he, my poor little son, he would have anxiety attacks if we even pulled in the driveway to the place. He wouldn't go in. So we started a couple times a month, we'd go to I, I, Ikea and we would pick out things. And um, then we would pull into the driveway, we would open the door, set the bag right inside the door and leave, right? And then eventually we got to where we could go in and put things away inside the unit, right? Then we got to where we spent more time in the unit, right? It was a transition process. Carrie, we'll be talking more about available housing units and stuff as we go forward. Um, really, we've got that group that's called home. Um, housing options must exist. And here's my Jesse. Yes. Um, do you mean Jackie's Jesse? Oh, Jackie's Jesse. You need to go away, sweetie, so I can talk. Yes. I don't want my condo back. Uh, yes, it's yours now. Um, so home housing options must exist is the group that really focuses on housing options but my point being wherever they live you're not going to just rent a place and move them in over the weekend there's a transition phase and what does that look like and it's going to look different for each person um, when jesse was 19 um, jesse moved out of my home and moved into a companion home and lived with his brother and his sister-in-law who provided that service to him. And he lived there for nine years. It was very successful. Um, but at, eventually he outgrew that placement and then he moved back home with me. Um, that didn't work very well. It was kind of like putting the toothpaste back in the tube. Um, so then we had to come up with some other options. We've rented a house and he moved in with a roommate. Um, that worked for a little while. He lived with his stepdad for a little while. And now he's living with his cousin. Um, and so, I mean, it's really how do we get those? Because that support is that second, that next part of that environment. How much support do they need, right? Um, there's personal care that can come into your home, right? You do not have to qualify for developmental disabilities to qualify for personal care services. So somebody can come into your home and provide those services. If you qualify for DDA, there's additional options. And um, there's residential care for those who need 24 seven care, right? Cause some individuals really need that 24 seven. Um, and some individuals wanna live in a group home. The companion home that Jesse lived in um, one person with a disability lives with a provider, and that provider could be married or single. They could have kids or a partner, um, but that provider cannot have a, another paid commitment outside the home. So they could be a student, but they couldn't be a teacher. Um, they couldn't have another paid job. Um, that model works really well for some people. Other people get really lonely in that model and really want more of a social model. Um, so it's really kind of just when you say with whom, 
right? What does that look like? Do you want an apartment? Are you noisy and maybe you need a house, not an apartment, right? Um, do you want to live with your friends? Or do you want to live, you know, maybe close to your friends, but not with them? My Jesse, he likes to be really close to mom. So, um, <laughs> sorry, he just corrected me. Jackie's Jesse. Um, but he doesn't like to live with mom. So he actually is living around the corner, about a block away. So he has free access to come to my home when he needs to and on the schedule. But he does not um, live here. He has his own home with his own um, housemate. So, um, and then, um, so we've talked about who can assist, right? How do you find those personal care providers? Um, at age 18, a parent can become a paid provider. So that means that when your child turns 18 years old, you can get contracted to provide the same supports and services that you're providing to them ahead of time. And that's great, right? That's an excellent way to help balance things. So when my son, we'll talk about my youngest son, um, moved into his teammate unit, right? I was his paid provider and I helped him get set up and get started and get stabilized there. Now I'm a working mom, so I've never been able to be the only provider my children have. Plus I've always needed backup. Again, on the day I die, I want my kids to grieve their mom, not have their whole world turned upside down. So that I have other providers as well. Someone else takes him out to do his grocery shopping. Someone else helps him with his housekeeping, right? Um, I help him with his medical appointments. I help him with his medications. I'm talking about your brother, Rory. Please don't interrupt. Um, sorry, guys. You know how it is being a mom. <laughs> anyway, and then realizing that they really need where whoever you live with and whoever's supporting you, it's the individual's home. And so I always just say, you know, their decor choices and the way they like to live are not the same as what I like. And so helping them to really identify their own style. Um, I have, before I go on from here, I just wanna touch base real quick on the assistance piece. Who can assist you? So the parent can become a paid provider, right? In my children's life, their aunt has been a paid provider. Multiple different cousins have been paid providers. As the cousins kind of leave school or leave college, kind of that in-between time, um, they come and they, they work with Jess or Rory for a while, and then they go off and launch into their world. Or maybe while they're in college, they're, they've been providers. None of them have stayed there very long, but they're there for a while to help. Um, we've also done that with neighbors and neighbors' children. And, um, you know, one of the ladies, one of my supervisors, her daughter was a pastor or is a pastor. But um, when she came back and she was waiting to get called to a church, she provided respite to us and helped with that. Um, so really kind of brainstorming who can be that assistant person that you can get contracted? Who's in your world? paraprofessionals, bus drivers, you know, are there people at the doctor's offices that you're connected with? Is there people maybe at your church, right? Extended family members. If you've got a, a student or a, a sibling, do they have friends that maybe want to do this, right? Looking at who can do this and who can provide those services if they're not needing the 24-7. If they do need 24 seven as an adult, your case manager is gonna help connect that to you, connect you to that. Okay, are there questions before I go on? If there is, please just put them in the chat. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm just talking at you, so I wanna make sure you have the opportunity to get what you need. Um, so the other thing is we've got a place to, to live, 
we've got people in our life, we need something to do, right? I reference this as employment or contribution, right? When my sons left school, um, Jesse left school at 21, Rory left at 18, and it happened to fall in 2010. And if you remember in 2010, we had that economic downturn and nobody was getting jobs, right? So um, one of the things that I said to my guys is, you know, I'm sorry, honey, I'm sorry you can't get a job, but that doesn't mean you don't have to contribute. So they did, you know, their respite provider took them up to um, the Parks and Rec uh, buildings and they helped weed around the tracks. They, you know, it's like, what is it they could do? They didn't schedule it with anybody. They just went and did it, partly because they didn't want to be locked into a schedule. Uh, Jesse, I believe, worked with Meals on Wheels for a while. Um, he also did uh, was a pastor in training for a while. It's looking at what is it they can contribute and how can they give back to others. Um, David Petoniak is this incredible mentor that and friend who lives back east. He lives in Blacksburg, Virginia. And I've had the honor and the pleasure of knowing David most of my son's lives. And he used to tell this story about this lady, and I don't even remember her name. Um, but they kept trying to get her involved in the community and get a community of people wrapped around her. And, you know, they would schedule things and people just wouldn't show up or they'd show up once or twice and then they would kind of fall by the wayside and not continue. But one time there was a family in the church where they were trying to get a group of people wrapped around her. Um, there was a family that attended that church whose house burned down. And because the family's home had burned down, um, the church was pulling together support and supplies to help that family. So this individual who they had been working so hard trying to get a group of people to wrap around her showed up to help. And by her showing up to help others, by her showing up to contribute, she ended up having a group of people that wrapped around her and became committed to her because she showed up to help others. So having our sons and daughters show up, you know, that is so important. Employment is hugely important because we've got to pay for things, right? I think Social Security is running right under 800 a month right now, 700 and something for SSI. And um, when you're looking at trying to afford a place to live, trying to have spending money to do things, right? Having an additional income is huge. And, you know, having that structure, routine, and predictability is huge, too. Um, to me, I think the structure, routine, and predictability and having a place where you belong is actually way more important than the paycheck. Um, but all of that works to help build a place to live. My son, Jesse, and I'm sorry I'm talking so much about my boys but that's my reference for building whole lives. Um, my son, Jesse, works for Ryanet, and he's worked there for nine years now. And when we went to get Jesse a job, he was tricky to get a job for because Jesse doesn't really care what he does. He cares who he does it with. He's really motivated by people. And he wanted to be a rock star. And Lo and behold, Ryanet is a company that was started by a band who wanted to build their own or make their own T-shirts. And then from there, they be started building um, screen printing materials and screen printing equipment. And they did all of their marketing through rock videos. And Jesse got to participate in that. Jesse's been in a lot of rock videos and got to participate with the band. And while they may pay him, to clean the floors or shred the um, cardboard or to empty the trash. What he really enjoys is being with his friends at work, being important to the people there and giving back to the whole. Um, he, uh, 
you know, Jesse will tell you that he is the mayor at work. And they, he, um, his boss asked him recently in a video how he became the mayor. And Jesse said, because everybody voted him to be the mayor, right? Because he went around every day when he got to work to check in on every person and say hello. He did his networking and his doorbelling, so to speak, and he got elected. And, um, you know, I will tell you, it's one of the most important things in his world. The year we were off because of the pandemic was very hard. His world got very small. And Jesse doesn't work a lot of hours. He, right now, he's working three days a week, two hours a day. Um, his stamina is not great. Um, and that's really kind of where we're at at the moment. But those six hours of work make a huge difference in his life. Before the pandemic, he was working 10 hours a week. Um, and we're hopeful to be wor maybe working back up to at least eight. He spends one day a week with his significant girlfriend, and he does not want to uh, give that up for a job. But it really, you know, that employment and that contribution, it's kind of how we all, you know, how you identify who you are and what you do, right? He'll say when he meets people, you know, I'm Jesse and I'm the mayor. And when he met the mayor of Vancouver, he was very sure to tell her that he was a mayor too and that they had a lot in common. And he was rooting for her to get reelected so they could both be mayors together. But those paychecks that he gets, those paychecks help cover supports that are not covered in other ways. They help cover dates with his girlfriend. They help cover ways for him to participate in being, being in reciprocal relationships, whether that's going out to lunch with a friend or going to a movie or paying for someone to help take him to medical appointments to support him, right? All of those employment contribution areas are so important for those reasons. It's how we identify right? And I think it's really important for them to know it's not all about you, honey, right? Um, when Jess was born, I kind of carried him around on a velvet pillow. And it wasn't until his younger brother was born with a disability that it was like, okay, guess what? We've all got something going on. Let's just figure out how to deal with it. Because the world's not going to circle just around one person. And I think that's important. It's important for them to be able to give back. I have, son, I have friends who have sons with significant disabilities. And they moved into a um, residential home that provided 24-7. And this particular individual, who's pretty impacted by his disability, um, moved in with someone who actually was more significantly impacted by his disability than he was. And the growth that we saw and my friend's son, after he moved in with that young man, was amazing because he now had somebody that he needed. He was the lead for. He needed to help care for. He needed to provide, right? It's so important that our, our sons and daughters learn to give back, to be the good uncle or the good son or the good grandson or the good friend, right? All of those things are important. Okay, Jesse. AKA, I do not care about anything else except my baby. Okay, I'm not sure if you caught all of that. He doesn't want all of his hours back because AKA, the only thing he it cares about, the most important thing is his baby, Jackie. Um, so I'm getting schooled. I don't know if you guys get schooled at home, but I hope me getting schooled. Oh, I got corrected. Excuse me. I hope that my correction makes you guys chuckle because you recognize this from your home. Um, so let's talk about fun and relaxation. Several of you had mentioned that and what, how, what's important to you, right? So how do we do fun and relaxation? What does that look like, right? Hobbies, physical fitness, organizations, clubs, movies, music, art, Oh, I put arc. <laughs> I meant art, 
with a T. Parks and Rec has a lot of great programs, classes, and other interests. Um, what are some of the things that your sons or daughters are interested in? Please put in the chat and share. Um, I will tell you that Jesse and Jackie love art. So once a week, they get together, they get together, and they have a date on Thursdays. And their date consists of food. They pick up food either at Olive Garden or someplace, or and then they bring it home. They, oh, Olive Garden or Red Robin. They, and when they go, one week they do it at Jesse's house, the next week they do it at Jackie's house. But regardless, they always get food delivered or picked up for them. They go and they watch a movie that they've picked out and talked about all week long, what they're going to watch. And then they do art. They like to color and they like to draw. And so they both sit and do that. And that's their weekly date. And that is a standing Thursday appointment. And it's very important. I see that some people like going to the library, others like online gaming. Absolutely. My son, Rory, he was really, um, when he was in school, he was very competitive in the Pokemon world. And he actually, we traveled with him to do national Pokemon tournaments. Um, once he moved into his unit, um, he was lonely and there was a game shop down the road within walking distance that he could walk to, but they did not play Pokemon. They only played Magic the Gathering there. So, oh, Yu-Gi-Oh, you're right, Jesse. It was Yu-Gi-Oh, not Pokemon. My goodness, my brain's getting old. First he was into Pokemon, then he was into Yu-Gi-Oh. And now he's into magic. Once he moved into his house and he could walk to the magic store, he changed his game. And for someone who transition is hard, I was really impressed. He worked hard to um, figure out how to play magic and how to build relationships. But now he has a lot of those, uh, those individuals that he's friends with from playing magic, both locally and in other states and even internationally. And that focus on Magic the Gathering for him has really opened up to be a um, opportunity to build other social, op social options. So um, one of the gentlemen who um, played Magic with him invited him to their bar. They had a bar where they, um, hung out as a group a lot and it was called what is it it's uh, orchards tap and so good times good friends was the name of the group so he invited rory there and rory started meeting more friends and then at the beginning of the pandemic right they actually caught covid from the being there and that was terrifying um and so Rory hasn't been going there, but now he's meeting with other people and going to people's house to do games. Um, they're having game nights at different individuals' homes, right? And how do we do that? And what does that look like? Um, so you think about it. My, my, I have another friend whose son was really into antique tractors, right? And she did some research. And lo and behold, there's an antique tractors club here in Clark County. And at first she would drive him out there and she would go in and she would sit through these antique tractor meetings. And she wasn't very thrilled because it's not her thing, but he was. And then her son started building relationships. And after a while, she didn't need to go into those meetings anymore. She could wait in the car while he went into the meetings. And then a while longer goes down, goes forward. and some of the participants started picking him up at his house and taking him to those meetings. So she didn't have to participate at all. And he built, built friendships around those areas of his interests, those areas of his hobbies, and those areas that he was highly interested in. So trying to figure out whatever it is that your son or daughter is highly focused on is really important. Um, and know that those things are gonna change. Early on, as an adult, 
my son Jesse, as I had mentioned earlier, was wanted to be a rock star and he was really into rock music. Um, and he used to go to concerts. He would buy a ticket or he would buy two tickets and invite, um, we would invite someone to go with him that also enjoyed the concert that could support him and drive him in that setting. Um, and at this point in life, he's not as interested in rock music. He's not as interested in, in the music that he used to be interested in. His interest has changed over time. And I think that's one of the things that I really want to um, emphasize is whether it's employment or housing or fun and relaxation, um, what we like, what we do, who we live with, where we live, that's going to change over time. I doubt many of us still live with the people or do what we did when we were 21 years old. Um, we're probably not living in the same house. We probably don't have the same job. And we probably don't have all the same activities. Um, some of them might continue, but I doubt that all of them do. In Clark County, uh, Parks and Rec has a great programs for individuals. Um, they have access to recreation, which are programs specifically for people with disabilities, but they also have inclusion programs. So any program that they have is open to anyone who, who anyone who wants to take those programs. And um, inclusion supports may be available. Um, prior to COVID, I would have said they would have been available. But like everyone else, um, trying to make sure there's enough people um, in all the positions is a challenge. But identify what it is. Um, another quick story, and then I'll, we can break because I realize we're getting close. But um, another friend of mine, she worked in the field. Um, she's mom too, but she worked in the field and she was supporting this lady who had worked at this job for 40 some years and um, done this work that was fine. I mean, the, the person who experienced the disability was fine doing this work, but it wasn't her passion. And when she got ready to retire and they were doing a person-centered plan, talking about what types of things she might do in her retirement, it came out that this person was an avid seamstress and that she knew how to embroidery and crochet and that she had all of these skills and talents that we could have been implementing into her work life, but we had never stopped to explore that. So exploring what it is that our individuals like to do, both for employment, but for that fun and relaxation is highly important. The other thing is um, a lot of individuals, if you ask them if they like something, no is going to be their first answer, especially if they haven't been exposed to it. If I could go back and my kids be little today, and I know what I know at this point in my life, I would have gone to way less therapy sessions and done way more activities with my kids. I would have taken them to the park and taken them swimming and done hiking and other things with my kids to expose them to more um, opportunities and more experiences. Um, hindsight's 2020. I did the best I could, and that's great. But it's never too late to start experiencing things. And I think those experiences are highly important. So, um, Emily, we're right at um, 7 o'clock. Do we want to pause for a break? Yeah, Darla, that sounds great. Thank you for all of this wonderful information. And we will be back at five minutes past the hour, 7.05 p.m. if you're in the Pacific time zone. If you're somebody, if you're somewhere else, um, we'll let you do the time tracking, but five minutes after wherever you may be and enjoy your break, stretch your body, do whatever you need to take care of yourself. Thank you so much.
All right, folks, 705, we'll get started again. And please reach out if you need any support in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, one thing I wanted to um, say before we moved off this slide is while there's lots of programs for specifically for individuals who experience disabilities, um, there's a lot of programs, I mean, just for any of us, right? So connecting your son or daughter through an interest-based program versus a disability-based program is an excellent way to expand their world and build new friends. Um, Jesse, only because I said he wouldn't like it, um, took a pottery class at Parks and Rec and um, ended up doing pottery for years and really built a lot of close relationships through that activity. And, you know, this is somebody who was sensory defensive and I would have never thought he would do pottery, um, but he's more stubborn than he is um, sensory defensive, I guess. So, okay, let's talk about transportation. I always put the Trans Am in here because when Jesse was growing up, his whole goal in life was to have a Trans Am. He wanted to be like Burt Reynolds in um, Best Little Whorehouse in Texas and get himself a Dolly Parton. Oh, Smokey and the Bandit, he corrected me, and get himself a Dolly Parton. Um, and so we actually saved to get him an old Trans Am at one point in time. But Jesse doesn't drive. Um, he doesn't read or write. And right now, driving on his own is not an option. So we have to figure out how else is he going to get to where he needs to go. And so there's lots of options. And not just one thing is going to work for everyone. But it's important that you think about these things, right? So there's always mom's taxi, right? There's always Uber or going with friends or the C-Van, right? Or C-Tran if you're able to take the big bus. Or there might be a combination of those things. You need to be able to get back and forth to your place of employment, back and forth to contributions, back and forth to meet with friends. And the more limited they are on transportation, the smaller their world's going to be. Um, I have another friend, I have a lot of friends, but um, who has a daughter that's an adult, and she does classes through Parks and Rec. And this woman, um, she's not even a young woman at this point in time, she's nonverbal, um, but mom's able to, because they've trained her with a trip trainer, is able to get on C-Van, and they're able to do door-to-door -door service and drive her down to her class at Parks and Rec so she can participate individually. This is someone who's a 24 seven care, but still is able to access that more independently. And I'm here to tell you, if they can access transportation independently, that really adds to their day. Um, Jesse, when he uses C-Van to get to work, C-Van has a 30 minute window. That means 30 minutes he's waiting for the bus and then he catches the bus, they drive him there, he works two hours, the bus picks him up, drives him home. That now takes his two hour day and it becomes a three or four hour day. Um, yes, you do, Jesse. Oh, yes. Yes, you do, right. You are learning a lot. I apologize if I misspoke. Yes, you're learning. You're doing great. <laughs> I'm given permission to continue. Um, so looking at all of those things right now with his um, date day with Jesse um, and Jackie on Thursdays, my his cousin usually takes him one way or picks Jackie up and brings her one way and Jackie's mom picks him up and takes him the other way. Um, but looking at, you know, what is it we're going to do when you're looking at those housing options and you're looking at that physical environment of where that house is going to be, transportation is a huge consideration. Um, I'm a country girl at heart, right? I was born up the, well, I wasn't born up the gorge. I was born back east, but I w grew up up the gorge and I really wanted to live in the country but I couldn't get access to services in the country that I needed for my sons. So I made the choice to live in town. And um, once they left home and I was an empty nester, I bought a house north of Battleground. 
And I'm like, yay, now I get to live in the country. Well, what I realized is, well, yes, I could live in the country because they were living in town, is that I spent so much time on the road driving between their house and my house and that they could not come see me unless I went and got them and provided that transportation for them. And so transportation is a huge consideration when you're thinking about things. Right now, where the way we have our living situation set up, um, my home um, is close to the mall, which is a permanent fixed bus route. So Rory can, Rory takes public transportation, just regular transportation. He's able to always get transportation on the bus to the mall and walk to mom's. He can get to me whenever he needs to. Um, Jesse, as I said, he lives about a block away. He can ride his three-wheel bicycle over here and um, come see me when he wants. And um, he can walk over here. And then transportation to other places are um, readily available. If you live within three quarters of a fixed, three quarters of a mile of a fixed bus route, you have access to paratransit, which is your C van in Clark County. In other counties and other communities, it's called something else, but most communities have some type of paratransit. And um, I just cannot tell you how important transportation is. And when looking at homes, if you're looking at buying a home or getting a permanent place to live, um, Making sure that the bus route, if you're going to be dependent upon paratransit or public transportation, making sure that it is a stable fixed bus route, because there are some bus routes that are currently fixed bus routes that may change in the future. But there's things like, you know, there's always going to be a bus on on mill plane or fourth plane or going to the mall or going to the transit center out in east county or north county right so looking at how does um where you're living impact that transportation issue beliefs faith um you know even if a person is an atheist, that is their belief. That is their faith. That is what they believe in. But we all have something that is a belief to our system. Oops, sorry, I went too fast. And so getting connected with others who have the same belief or the same faith that you do um, is important. And it is a way to round out their life. As an adult, there's not one thing that's going to um, be their life. You know, when they're in school, it's like, okay, they're in school six hours a day. You throw on an extracurricular activity, whether it's a sports activity or a club, right? That kind of fills their day. They come home and they're with family. Okay. Well, as an adult, you know, some may work eight hours a day, five days a week, but the majority of individuals don't. It would be great if they did. Um, but I know for my son, he just doesn't have the stamina to work that much. Um, so how else do we fill out those days? Um, that transportation piece, that friendship piece, that family piece, those activities, those interests, right? Community engagement, all of those different things. In my mind, it's like a puzzle. And each of these things is one piece of the puzzle. And one piece doesn't make an entire picture or an entire life, but you can't make it without all the individual pieces. For Jesse, um, his church is very important to him and um, was much more important as he was growing up. As I told you, he participated in a pastors and training program and then tried to be my counselor because he was a pastor. That was pretty funny. Yeah. Um, my other son is not, um, does not attend church. He is not faith-based at all. Um, but he does connect with other people who have the same type of beliefs that he does. Um, anywhere you connect is a way to connect with other people. It's a way to build those relationships. It's a way to give back to others. And those are also critically important. Um, 
self-advocacy. So I think we talked about this in our agenda as finding your voice, right? Um, some of the um, comments early on about what does a real life or whole life look like, right? Dignity came up, um, happiness, purpose, excitement for the future, right? All of these different things. Um, the term self-advocacy has actually lost favor um, because honestly it became a label and anything that becomes a label loses favor. Um, and as the young adults with disabilities, I call them young. If they're under 60, they're young to me. So, <laughs> um, but they're like, everybody is a self-advocate. And that's true. And that's exactly what we want to teach our sons and daughters from an early age, right? If, if they're two, which jammies do you want to wear? If, you know, whatever that decision making is at whatever age, have them make the decisions and the choices and help them to understand. We've got Thanksgiving coming up, right? And I informed the family that I wasn't doing all the cooking everybody was. What did they want to make, right? Jesse announced he'd be happy to bring the dinner rolls. So, you know, that was his choice. We're going to work on expanding that next year, but dinner rolls are fine for this year. And trying to figure out where is it they can have their voice? How do they make sure and have their voice be heard? Um, Last week at our building independence class on Thursday, um, we had about 16 young adults between the ages of 18 and probably 40, I would say. And we had our 18th legislative district to come and talk to them. And we did not prepare them a whole lot. We didn't give them talking points. We just help them to have a voice to ask their questions. And the questions that they asked the legislators were so amazing. Why do you have to have an IQ score to qualify for DDA? Wow, I'm not sure my guys even know you do. Um, you know, Jesse asked, when are we going to get to stop wearing masks and face shields, right? Um, just really, they were asking questions that was important to them, what was important to their lives. Some of them were talking about how important employment services were. Others were talking about the high cost of living, right? But if you would have asked me when my children were little about a group of adults meeting and talking to their legislators, I would not have thought the quality of questions that our young adults brought out is what would come out, right? So making sure and build those self-advocacy, it doesn't have to be legislative advocacy, just making sure that they have their voice to talk about what's really important to them. That's critical. Um, that is what's critical to them. Just half a second. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Um, so really looking at the self-advocacy piece, um, Hattie, our, um, our peace team member who really does a lot of work with our young adults, she's going to be starting a self-advocacy group. Um, I don't know what we're going to call it. It might be a people first group. It might be a SAIL, which is self-advocates and leadership. It might be an allies group. I don't know what we're going to call it. We're going to let the self-advocates figure it out, our young adults, to see what it is they want. And they get to focus on what type of advocacy they want to do. But this is another great way to get them involved. And I'm here to tell you, our self-advocates have gotten so many laws passed in our state. It's amazing. Okay. Um, let's talk about paid supports, because paid supports is a huge piece of filling out that puzzle, right? I'm going to talk about me as an individual. I'm a working mom, right? And um, so I work full time. And I, even though my children are grown, um, they still need a lot from me. I have an aging mom in place. Um, and my mom needs supports from me as well. And I have grandkids that I want to be able to support and do things with. And I have homes that need attention, right? 
I always like to say I can do anything, but I can't do everything. So myself as a fully capable adult, I hire people to help with things. I hired someone to fix the roof, or I'll hire someone to help with the plumbing, or I hire somebody to help with the house. Um, our sons and daughters are no different. They need paid supports. The difference is how are we going to get them paid for? Um, so it's important when you think about your individual that you're building a whole life for, right? What do those paid supports look like? Um, developmental disabilities, developmental vocational rehabilitation. Sorry, it's division of vocational rehabilitation. That was a major oops. Um, low income services, social security, right? A lot of these things are nothing more than a way to pay for services. Developmental disabilities, disabilities does not provide the service. They pay for the service. So let's talk supported employment is something we talked about earlier, right? We talked about how important employment is. Well, developmental disabilities will pay for a supported employment coach to help people get jobs, right? Uh, the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation helps identify what job skills are important, what you would be good at, and help find a job and get the job where developmental disabilities were paved that same job coach long term. A lot of these government services, I think of them as bank accounts, right? And if you don't qualify for developmental disabilities, it's like, okay, you don't go to the credit union, but you still have access to a bank. How do we get these services paid for? And what we can't pay for, can we do some private pay? Remember when we talked about getting the strings off the dollars, right? That's where some of our private pay services come from right now. So my son, Jesse, has a friend, Zach, who helps him with his doctor's appointments. And Zach is excellent at helping Jesse with medical appointments. I could take Jesse to the doctor, but Jesse's more comfortable going to the doctor with his friend, Zach. We private pay for Zach's services to help with that and to teach Jesse how to be more successful in those environments. That is a service we choose to private pay with some of the other um, dollars that we've gotten the strings off of. So the big three, let's talk developmental disabilities, right? What do you get from developmental disabilities? You get your personal care. Personal care, otherwise known as community first choice, pays for activities of daily living. They're going to help with cooking and cleaning and grocery shopping and medical appointments sometimes and um, looking at what is it that that individual needs. Do they need help with their banking? Do they need help getting dressed? Do they need help with mobility, right? Um, do they need help with medications, right? Those all come out of your personal care. DDA will pay for those if you have someone under the age of 18. To qualify, you need to qualify for Medicaid. You need to functionally qualify and you need to have an assessment. If you qualify for DDA services over the age of 18, DDA will cover the personal care as well. If you do not qualify for DDA, you can still get personal care. You just are gonna go through a different agency. You're gonna go through agents, through aging and disability services. You're gonna have a whole night where developmental disabilities comes and talks about their services. De Developmental Disabilities Administration, DDA, also will pay for residential supports. So what does that mean? Remember when we were talking about housing and I talked about someone who needed 24-7 care, right? That's what DDA is going to pay for. They're going to pay for those individuals who need 24-7 care. If you need... Um, if you're in a residential setting or you're in a companion home setting, DDA is going to pay for that. You talk about my son, Rory, who lives in his teammate setting. He's got personal care who comes in and helps provide his support. He does not need 24-7 care. 
Developmental disabilities is going to pay for supported employment. We mentioned that a little bit earlier. That's a job coach to come and help identify what services, what work they would be good at, do community assessments, and help them get stabilized on the job. And then if they're with DDA, stay with them long term. So Emily was actually Jesse's job coach way back when, when he was um, first got out of school. And we did several community-based assessments. He worked at the Rock Pizza, folding pizza boxes and doing, um, I think he rolled silverware for the Rock. Um, I think he did a stint at one of the movie theaters, taking movie tickets to see if he would be good at that. But what Jesse really wanted to do was to be a rock star. So doing janitorial work was never on Jesse's list. He didn't go to Ryanette to do janitorial work. He went to Ryanette to be that rock star and to be in those rock videos. And it has worked beautifully. He's been there for nine years. Um, community access is a service that DDA provides. And that's someone to help get you out, get your loved one out in the community and do activities. So it could be someone to take them to meet with their friends, right? Um, to do those types of things. We use our respite this way as well. The respite provider will take Jesse and connect Jesse with his friends and they'll all go out to a movie or they'll all go um, to lunch together. The respite provider oftentimes has said that she feels like a, um, a, uh, a, what do you call it? A tour guide, right? And a taxi driver because she helps set up activities for them to do together with their friends and then helps facilitate that happening and helps drive them to, you know, provide the transportation or set up transportation if that needs to be done. The other thing that DDA can provide is home modifications. Right. So when Jesse, Jesse currently lives in a, um, a condo around the corner from me that I purchased. And when Jesse was getting ready to move in there, I knew that we needed to do some modifications in the bathroom. And DDA came in and provided those modifications. I had to request that and go through, jump through their hoops. But DDA will help cover those things. DDA does not do any of this directly. They pay other people that they're contracted with to provide those services. And if you need help getting connected to developmental disabilities, we can help you with that paperwork. We can help you figure out which supports and services are going to work for you and your family. And we can help you jump through those hoops. And when I say we, I'm talking about Peace Northwest. That's the service that we provide. And we're a free service to help families get those things done. So the next big three uh, is, is the Social Security Administration. There's several things that you can get through Social Security Administration. Over the age of 18, if you functionally qualify and um, you can pull supplemental security income. This is income for individuals who have not worked, do not have enough of a work record to pull on their own social security or cannot pull on their parents' social security at this point in time. Social security right now, or the SSI right now, is what is running right under um, $800 a month. I think it's 790 something a month. Um, most important, though, if you get $1 of Social Security, you're going to get Medicaid. So remember that because that Medicaid is the most important part of your SSI. If you work for a while, so both my sons, Jesse and Rory, have been working. I shared Jesse has worked at Ryanette for nine years. So Jesse has built up his own Social Security credits, quarters, I think they call them, and he's able to pull on his own Social Security. So Jesse gets SSDI, he gets SSI, and he gets his wage. Now, when you get SSDI, they deduct that from your SSI. So you don't get, he's not getting the full amount of SSI, but he's getting more money than he would be if he got only SSI by having the three different income sources. He has his wage, 
he has his social security disability insurance that's the social that's the funds that he's paid into social security and he has his ssi because he hasn't got to the level yet where he can where he's making enough to only pull on his own record you're going to have at least one full night on social security i believe it's in february where you're going to learn all kinds of ins and outs about social security Tonight, my goal in telling you about this is just to tell you that this is one of the those pieces of paid services and supports that's important. This is one of those places we get those dollars. Let's say you have a parent that has passed away or retired. An individual then may be able to pull on their parent's social security. So if I passed away today, Jesse could pull on my social security and get what's called Social Security Disabled Adult Child. That's actually a higher amount of money than he's going to get on SSI or SSDI, right? And again, there's mathematical equations for each of these programs, and there's qualifying factors in how they can work together. Um, but this is important, and you are going to have a, um, a class just on this. As you're working with Social Security, there's several things called work incentives. Um, one is called a plan for achieving self-sufficiency, and another is called an impairment work um, expense, an IRWE. And these are items that you'll be learning about. So let's say Jesse had to have steel-toed boots, and they had to be specially modified because of his feet, which are really large, and he's flat-footed due to his disability. We then could get an impairment-related work expense to help cover a portion of the cost of that um, expense for those boots. If he lived out in Battleground and he had to take a Uber to work to get to his place of employment, we could submit part of that as an Irway, they wouldn't cover all of it, but they may cover 50% of it, of that expense. So those are things, again, these are things that this social security topic, it could, I could spend weeks just on this. All I'm doing is introducing this to you. You do not need to be an expert on this. You just need to know who to ask. But remember when I said the most important part of SSI is Medicaid, that's because even through Developmental Disabilities Administration, it's your Medicaid dollars that covers all of your services and supports. So um, I, I don't know if any of you have heard about a waiver. Oh, I see we've got some stuff here. Oh, there we go. We've got people putting details in here on the different classes. Thank you, Emily. Um, through Developmental Disabilities Administration, there's different waivers you can get, and there are different levels of services. Those are all Medicaid funded. You need to have that Medicaid to cover your um, services and your supports. So while yes, Medicaid might be an insurance that covers your medical, What's more important is they're going to cover your supported employment. They're going to pay for your respite. They're going to cover your personal care expense. They're going to help pay for an adult family home. And they're going to cover some of those prescription drugs and therapies and the other services and supports. They're going to help cover those home modifications that you might need to be made. Um, they're going to cover way more than just the medical insurance. So. Some parents will say, well, I don't need to see if my child qualifies for SSI or Medicaid because he's on my insurance and he's living at home and we don't need the extra income right now. That's great. Do you have enough income to cover the paying for the personal care so that he can move or she could move out on her own? Do you have enough income to cover the expenses when you're not here? That's where you get connected to Medicaid and have those services and supports covered. Okay. Um, and then we're going to talk about where do we begin, right? 
Um, and as Walt Disney says, the way to get started is to quit talking about it and start doing. And my favorite picture, my favorite thought on all of this is you don't have to see the top of the staircase to take the first step. What does that first step look like? Um, when Jesse turned 14 or 15, um, I got really panicked and I thought, oh, crud, I've got to do all this transition stuff. What do I do? Who do I call? And it was like, okay, Darla, take a deep breath. You to help people with this all the time, make a list. So I did. I made a list and I've tweaked it and tweaked it a million times and put ages to it and have been handing it out for the last 17 years. Um, but one of the things I did, because when Jesse was that age, I had no idea how much support he was going to need. Um, so I called a meeting with some of my support people and um, my friend David and my friend Zach, and we were talking about residential and what does that look like? And my friend David had the most beautiful suggestion. He said, Darla, you need to go to the beach for the weekend. <laughs> I love the beach. It's my favorite place in the whole world. So um, I thought that was a beautiful idea, but I had no idea what that meant as far as working with residential for my kids. And he said, what I needed to do was have someone come in the home that they did not see as a caregiver, maybe a sibling maybe a friend of a sibling, but somebody that could be there to help them if they needed it, but someone that my sons would not identify as a caregiver. For me to go to the beach, and then that person's job was to watch and see what the kids knew how to do. Did they know to turn the lights on when it got dark? Did they know when to take their meds or how to take their meds on their own? What did they do when it was time for a meal? Did they know how to prepare a meal? Or did they just sit and wait for someone to watch, to, to do that? Um, the support person or the person that um, we, when we did it, it was actually my son's friend who came and stayed with them, knew that if it got to a certain point in time, they could do a prompt. Jesse, did you need to take your medicine? Right? And if Jesse said no, you know, they could take it to the next level. Okay, Jesse, I think it's time we take our medicine now right? And maybe set the meds out for Jess. Or I think it's time we get something to eat now if he hadn't gotten himself something to eat. But the whole time, this individual made lists of things of what it was my sons knew how to do and what they didn't know how to do when I wasn't around. And that was critical. And that is where our first step happened, is how do we start working on what it is we need to learn so we even know how much support to put in place. You know, there's lots of things that we can try. Um, I've had friends who have um, set up apartments in their garage or in a um, bonus room above a garage. They've set up little mini apartments to help teach their sons or daughters how to live independently. I've had um, one of the things we did when the kids were teenagers is we tried for a while setting up everybody had a night that they were responsible for dinner right so jesse had a night and rory had a night and mom had a night and tj had a night and we had a night that we ate out right so if it was their night that they were responsible for dinner right they had to figure out what were they going to eat we then figured out the grocery list for that we then went to the store and they had to shop for that, right? Now, maybe on their night, on Jesse's night, maybe he wanted to have lasagna and salad. So we would buy a frozen lasagna and a bag of salad, right? He didn't have to become a chef to participate in this, right? Maybe they wanted to have grilled cheese sandwiches and tomato soup, right? But they had to come up with what were we going to do? And then they had to practice shopping. And then they had to practice doing stuff for others, right? It's how do we include them? How do we teach them for where, from, for where they're, from where they're at? Everybody has, is at a different place. But you start with the first step, right? 
what is it they like doing? What, where can they contribute? Is there a place in their school they can contribute? Um, you know, my guys, I always um, encourage them. I made them when they were littler. You can't make adults do things. Um, but when they were little, they always adopted somebody for Christmas that was in need. Um, because they need to practice being the ones to give to others. They need to practice shopping for someone else and thinking about others. What does that look like? And how do we teach them those things? You begin with the first step. And when you get on that step, it's a little bit easier to see. And then you take the next step, right? When my friend said we were going, to, I needed to apply for that um, teammate unit for Rory, I thought she was crazy. But we went ahead and we applied and it took a year before he spent the first night. It took probably three or four years before he was spending more nights there than he was spending at my house. Rory's turning 30 this year and we've had that unit since he was 19 years old. And I'm here to tell you the only night he wants to stay at mom's now is Christmas Eve. And it really has nothing to do with mom. It's all about the presents. Um, but you know what? When they spend Christmas Eve at mom's house now, he gets to play Santa and stuff stockings, right? It's always about taking them to the next level. What is it they learn? How do we teach them? How do we help them grow? How do we help them connect to others? How do we find ways for them to have dignity? And you know what? There is the dignity of risk. I would have loved to have put my kids in a bubble and protect them from the entire world. But when you do that, you're also limiting them from the whole world. So helping them have dignity and helping them see what is the next step and baby steps. You don't have to do all of this at once, right? Each step, if you would have told me my kids would all leave home or we would have rented a place for all of them or have a residential option for them at 19, I would have argued with you. Was not my goal was not what I wanted to do. I thought if they were out of the house by the time they were 35, we'd be doing good. You know, it rolled out differently for each of them and each of their lives looks different. And it looks different at 32 than it did at 22. And you know what? It's gonna look different again at 42. And how do we help them to grow and become the people they wanna be? How do we help them be good neighbors? How do we help them um, contribute and receive so that they can be a full part of the community and be a full part of their society and have a full life because that's really what it's all about. And that, my friends, is what I've got for you. So are there questions? Darla, before we jump into any questions in the chat, we want to also post a link to a survey. We're really hoping that if people are willing, um, at some point, you can take a moment to fill out the survey because your feedback helps to keep this series going. So we appreciate your input and thank you, Darla. This is so much wonderful information. And Jesse, if you can hear me, I love your input as well. Um, and I will monitor the chat for any questions. Looks like Beth put the survey in there. Thank you. Okay, I put my email in the chat. And um, at Peace, we have a whole team of people. There's 10 of us now. And we're all parents. And we're all available to help you guys with wherever you're at, whether that's school issues, or um, you're needing to look at residential options, or you need to help get your son or daughter more involved in the community. Um, whatever it might be, we're there and we're free and we can help you. We're here to help you navigate. That's actually what we're paid to do is to help you navigate all of these crazy systems. But the one thing that I realize in life is that you, life is not built out of systems, right? Um, 
DDA is not going to offer your son or daughter a whole life. Neither is Social Security and neither is employment. Um, because a whole life doesn't come from one thing. A whole life comes from the individual dreaming and envisioning and getting to try new things and piecing it all together. And there's no system that does that. That's what us as family members get to help with our son or daughter. Um, so who offers the class you mentioned for learning to date? So that is PEACE, um, but there are other classes offered as well. So one thing I wanna tell you about PEACE, cause I've been telling you a lot of things that we do, but one of the main things that we do is we share all the information that everyone else is doing, right? So we're not just about, this is what PEACE does. We'll tell you what Swindells is offering. We'll tell you what, um, NWDSA is offering, we'll tell you what is happening in other parts of the state, and we'll connect you to all the resources and all the trainings. We're not about kind of creating a corner of services and supports. We're about building bridges to everyone. Um, so Peace does do the dating class. Um, so you want to date just because I had a son wanting to date. And that's honestly why we started that group. Um, we started building independence because he needed to learn some things that he couldn't learn from me as an adult. He needed to learn other ways. Um, and that's how we get things going. We had one of our adults wanted to do, um, he was really into fandom things. Um, fandom is when you're a big fan of certain things. So you could be a fandom over Star Wars or Star Trek or Disney or Magic the Gathering or Marvel. Um, and so he started a um, random fandom group and we're supporting him to do that. If you've got a need and you can't find it, you let us know. We'll help you find it. We'll help you navigate the system. And if it doesn't exist, we'll try to create it. Honestly, that's how we got so absorbed in the home stuff right now. We've been working on stuff with families for probably a decade. And what we realize is what's needed really didn't exist in Clark County or in much of the state. So we're working really hard now to create some of those options. And um, if you're looking at those home options and, and looking at how do we get our sons and daughters launched, right? And how do we help them be successful in that? Connect with us because we're going to have some great stuff starting in January. Tanya put in our newsletter. Tanya is... Um, the one who writes our newsletter and she does an amazing job. She's got it going out in five languages right now. She's just phenomenal. Um, and our newsletter has, as I mentioned, not just our information, but everybody's. Um, and if there's something you need, let us know. 